So I'm actually going to stay on stage because uh, my panelists are here. We're now going a little bit deeper into the mobile gaming space. We're going to talk about user acquisition specifically. So I'm very happy to welcome on stage, we, I see David Kim from Animoca, Gonzalo Fasaneya from, from Gameloft. I also have uh, Oscar from, from Akamon and Jan from Vuga. Welcome on stage. Hello. Cool. I think we have, we have a brief slide deck to introduce uh, the topic. As I said, we're talking about um, player acquisition. And um, I'm very excited to have this, this, um, these developers on stage. They're very different, completely different backgrounds. They're going to tell us a little bit more about it. But um, obviously, once you have a game, once you have your creation, once you have a product that you believe in, uh, the, the most challenging part starts, which is how do you get users that are as passionate as you are about your product, right? And not as passionate, but also they spend a little bit of money. So we're going to talk about that. Um, do we have the slide deck? All right, it, it looks like the presentation is here. So I, as I was saying, obviously, creating a game is, is the first step. But then you're facing the users. You need to face the app store. And obviously, you need to make money, right? The, we were looking for ROI. When I, when I look at, at games, I actually look at, at, at just a product with a life, with a life cycle, right? And um, so during this, this panel, I'd like to cover the different phases of, of a life cycle of a game. And what are the, the player acquisition techniques that you apply on each phase, right? The first stage is obviously getting ready. You want to make sure that your game is out there that has the, the necessary tracking, analytics tools, that you have defined your KPIs, whatever the, 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 the indicators of success that you want to track during the life cycle of that game. Then you normally do a soft launch. You test some markets, the ones that you believe are going to be stronger, but also the ones that perform very well to, to track the KPIs and E-Trade. Then the big launch comes in, and, and you need to make sure that all the distribution channels are in place. We're going to talk about what channels work, what channels don't work, how do you uh, deal with so many SDKs that are out there, and so on. Then there's the ROI search, right? I mean, maybe in the very beginning of the launch, you're not that worried about return of investment. Your main focus is to get eyeballs, to make sure that, that, that users get your, your name. But there's a moment in which you need to look for ROI, right? And, and then the optimization starts. You want to make sure that, that, that you are actually paying less than what you're getting in return. So we're going to talk about how do we define ROI, how do we define the lifetime value of the user. And then there's the optimization phase where you tweak the game a little bit more. You, maybe you reduce the number of channels. And, and you try to get as much as you can from the game before the decline starts. And I also want to get your take on the decline phase. What do you do when a game is old, when, when well, maybe you have still some users, but, but you're not paying that much attention. I think probably in the audience, we have uh, definitely mobile entrepreneurs. I know some of them, non necessary game developers. So let's try to, to make it general for other kind of apps as well. But um, I want to get your take on, on what's the life cycle of a game in general. And again, how do you tweak your player acquisition, um, uh, your player acquisition uh, techniques during these different phases? So as I said, I'm very happy to have you guys on, on stage. We have Jan, CEO of Vuga. We have um, Oscar from Akamon. He runs user acquisition. Gonzalo from Gameloft. He also runs user acquisition at Gameloft. And David Kim, co-founder and CEO of Animoca. Why don't we start with a quick intro of your companies? Maybe not everyone is familiar with your companies. Well, well let's start with Jan. Um, tell us more about Vuga. <laughs> well, Vuga is a game developer based in Berlin. We make games for mobile phones and um, originally started on the Facebook platform. Now about 70% of our revenue is on mobile. And Vuga, maybe without getting too long, the one thing we try to do is to repeatedly create hits, which is kind of an oxymoron. but um, We've had five hits in the past, five big hits in the past three and a half years, and that's kind of our, our goal for the future is to repeatedly create hits. Cool. Oscar? Well, I'm from Akamon, I'm the CMO, and in Akamon, uh, we develop social traditional games and social casino games. 
Uh, we focus on a market that we can say that there are not a very good monetization market. That means South Europe and especially LATAM. And we do through three platforms. We have a .com in which uh, it's when, when the company starts and when, where we have the most of the revenues. We then also move to Facebook where we have more than 15 apps. And we are moving to mobile probably a little bit later than these guys, but also our markets are going later. So, yeah. Well, what are your markets, sorry? Uh, so Europe and Latin, especially okay. like yeah. Brazil, it's, it's converting in a yeah. very good market. Cool. Gonzalo. So Gameloft is 100% mobile. He's uh, the founder of Gameloft. He's an ex Ubisoft. He's a founder as well of uh, Ubisoft. He left when he thought that, um, that mobile was the next uh, thing for games. That was 10 years ago, and um, we are 100% mobile. Uh, we made games like Despicable Me, we have big licenses, and uh, 15 studios around the world. Yeah, that's basically cool. it. David? Hi. Uh, <clears throat> Animoca is based in Hong Kong, but uh, the bulk of the revenues are derived outside, um, mostly US, uh, 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 bul Balkan, Big part in Asia, big part in US. We're a little bit weak on Europe, so for any European developers, would love to know you. Publishers would love to know you. Um, but uh, we've been we've been doing various games for the last 15 years in di different uh, iterations of the company. But uh, right now, we're very focused on mobile games. We take a slightly different approach in that we're actually not trying to get the next big. Candy Crush per se, but that we're actually we have a kind of a supermarket kind of an approach where we have uh, over th almost 400 games, uh, something for everyone, and we're trying just trying to have a broad reach uh, in various uh, segments of the population in, in many different countries. And that's our approach. Cool. Let's start from the very beginning. How do you decide the game is actually ready to be launched? How how's the decision making process in your companies? Um, Jan, for example. <laughs> so we have, a, we have a pretty strict process of bringing the games from prototyping to uh, production to soft launch to launch. To give you an idea of the numbers, we develop between 50 and 60 prototypes per year, of which about 15 go into production, 10 get soft launched, and 5 launch. And we hope to have one to two hits out of that. So it's a pretty tough process. And generally, the later you are in the game, um, the more data-driven it becomes. Well, when you have prototypes, it's a lot about feeling. Is this fun? Yes, it is. No, it's not. I don't think so, and so on. So it's dirty, messy, and political. But then the later you get, uh, you can start doing focus groups. You can do soft launches. You can you know, maybe different names, different companies, launch it somewhere, just testing things out. Um, but in the end, if we knew how to always produce hits with 100% uh, probability, then you know, <laughs> we'd be having this discussion on the beach somewhere. A exactly, exactly. Um, on average, could you say how many people play your games before they get launched? Is that, do you have well, a sense of that? During soft launch, I'd say 15 to 20,000 okay. is a good number. Yeah, cool. What about Game Loft? So before launching <laughs> a game, they're different about like, what you do, like, uh, it's like going outside to show the prototype. The good thing about Gameloft, and bad thing sometimes as well, is that we're stuck 6,000 people. So we kind of share the builds with everybody, and uh, everybody starts playing the game. And then you s there's a sort of uh, discussion that starts by emails, by conversations, conferences, and stuff. And there's a sort of feeling of each one of our games. And uh, there's a, an open discussion with the team and the salespeople and uh, the local guys, depending on for for what market that game is focused as well, that we have local guys in all the studios there, in, the, in, in Europe, in Asia, in, in the US. And the ones that are successful have a, a good feedback from the very prototype uh, are the ones that go to soft launch. And uh, with soft launch, in not, I mean, the majority of the companies, they pick the same, the same countries for soft launch. In our case, we, we make games for local, for local places, so like, uh, like something very specific for Asia, uh, or Eastern Europe or stuff like that. So we pick one of those countries, we soft launch there, then we check the KPIs, of course, and, right. uh, and then we move forward. Cool. David, how, 
We take a, we take a, a kind of a low risk approach. Uh, actually, we were having a fairly interesting debate amongst the panelists backstage about how, how we approach things differently. And the way that Yan's company uh, approaches it is very different than us. We would take, a, we, have a, we have almost 400 games, but we actually have about a half a dozen engines that we work off of. And we basically rework what we already know how to do well. And so what we'll do is, we'll, let's say a, a, a running game that has worked extremely well. What we'll do is we'll rejig it. Uh, we, have, we work with a lot of different brands. So we'll put some different brands on it, uh, tweak, and see if something catches. And typically, we'll actually launch in our own backyard, Hong Kong, which is a very international crowd, um, is a very concentrated, big gaming crowd. And so to about 50,000 users, we'll actually go and launch and see how it takes. And then we'll learn, and then we'll game balance, and we'll iterate three, four times in Hong Kong or in other markets. And once it's, we feel that it's ready, then we'll tr test market in another big market to make sure that there's, so, so that we can re, uh, so that we can uh, 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 replicate the same user patterns. And then we'll do a much bigger launch. Yep. Cool. Oscar, do you have anything to add? I mean, you guys have a smaller team, right? Yeah. How, compared to, to some of these big publishers, how, how do you? Of course, I probably say it's a little bit more close what Jan says. We try to make prototypes and then test it with probably with uh, people in social media or, you know, like making people co-create the game. Like, mm -hmm. we're trying this game. What do you think? What can you add? Then uh, we choose one of the leader prototypes we do, and then we, we send more traffic. We can go to a soft launch, in which we say like the minimum KPIs we can expect for this game. And then uh, we acquire some traffic, some free traffic from our other games to save money, and some traffic from good uh, sources like you know Facebook. Yep. Because uh, it's not the moment to test uh, new acquisition channels. It's the moment to get the good traffic and focus on, on the main KPIs, like uh, one day, seven day, after the retention, just to see if the people will like this kind of game. Don't, don't think another thing that just, it's gonna have a room this game or not. Right. Um, I'd like to dig a little bit more on the soft la launch. How do you select the countries and what are generally your metrics? Uh, what, what are we looking for when we're testing a game? Um, David, you're nodding. <laughs> what, yeah. what are you looking when you're soft launching? What are typically the main metrics? Or what's this, the size of the sample of users that you're uh, trying to get? And what do you ask them? Or what are you trying to solve while soft launching? It really does depend on the game that we're launching. Because, again, because we do take kind of a supermarket approach, we don't, have a, we don't go into any specific game with any dogma. And, we make sure that within our company, we have about uh, six, seven studios. They all work independently, and we make sure, okay, don't get overly emotional about your game. Whatever number, whatever tells us the number works, works. And what doesn't work, doesn't work. Right. And so how we approach it, we'll take, we'll generally know, for example, in Korea, we'll know that a certain type of a character-based game, female-oriented, will will garner this kind of a reaction and will try to retrofit what we already know into a new game design, mm -hmm. uh, kind of uh, whether it's a reskin of an older game or whether it's a different character. And what we'll do is we'll, and we'll make sure that the sample size is big enough that we can see general trends so that we, so that we can take out some of the outliers. And typically within the first week of launch, we know if it's viral because, um, and again, uh, talking to Yan, we have an approach where we have enough users of our own that we can test market fairly cost effectively. And, we'll see it, and if it does have a viral catch such that if we don't push anymore, we'll see how it trends. And if it works, then we'll actually put some real marketing dollars and we'll try to get user, uh, new additional users outside of our own ecosphere and push out the game and then we'll tr replicate that in some of the other markets as we go on. Um, yeah. Cool. Very cool. Gonzalo, yes. you do a lot of soft launches at the same time, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how, 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 what are your main metrics? I mean, 
the main metrics is that uh, first of all you need to get a good sample as he said of, uh, of users sometimes it's very tough depending on what's the, the category of these games but uh, more or less if you have I don't know like 20 20,000 DAUs per day you more or less are able to say to get conclusions out of it right and um, but uh, I mean it's not just one thing that you check you know I mean there's um, the usual things that everybody checks like retention uh, average time uh, not really at the very beginning the monetization itself of what they buy that's uh, something that comes a bit later maybe after the second update of the of the of the soft launch uh, build that you have out there so so I would I would say that more mm, the, the gameplay and uh, if people is engaged in the game the retention is at the very beginning uh, a key metric and maybe the RPU or like where the the, mo the money is it comes a bit after that um, and regarding soft launching a lot of games at the same time um, I remember that the, the once we launched soft launch four games at the same time and uh, it was so difficult to get traffic for four of them you know we have a lot of uh, applications ourselves so we have a, uh, a, a good tool of cross promotion and stuff but we, we didn't have inventory enough so at the end we were like uh, in really investing a lot for, for soft launches so we realized that uh, it was it was very tough but having 15 studios and imagine that the, like um, three of them say okay I have that ready and they call the user acquisition team saying oh, yeah, I need your I need the campaign so it's, it's very tough I would not recommend to have more than one soft launch uh, yeah. although maybe if it is a completely different country and a completely different uh, focus yep. of the game it could work but um, but yeah I mean uh, soft launching is super super important and uh, and getting a good sample it focusing on retention at the beginning and after that on the on the monetization of the game yeah yep um, for Western games, do you think Canada and Australia are still the top soft launching countries? Have you experimented with other countries that are interesting? Because they're extremely expensive. I mean, we, we publish the, the average bids on a monthly basis, and Canada and Australia are always over $2.5, yeah. right, CPI? That's something that developers typically cannot pay. Well, wh where do you go if, if Canada and Australia are that expensive? Sometimes I wonder how the Canadians must see the App Store because they have <laughs> yeah, all yeah. these games coming they and get, going. They and get all the cool stuff, but also all the crap as <laughs> yeah. well. I mean, <laughs> no, but in the end, um, I watch out for looking at the money side too much at, during soft launch because if you think about it, doing a launch for a game and then committing to kind of post-launch production with a team of whatever it is, eight to ten people, that's a easily million dollar or more decision. And you know, so if you say you need 10,000 Canadians at two dollars fifty each, that's twenty-five thousand, <laughs> which compared to your other investment is is not a lot. And right. so we tend to kind of disregard that. So I prefer to do that rather than looking for cheaper geographies. You can use the cheaper geographies to do more of the technical stuff. Okay. You know, like does it crash on phone X Y Z? And, and, and so which on. which other geographies have you used? Just to give the audience a, a little bit more examples, right? Yeah. Well, we typically do Canada and Australia for the kind of user testing, and then if we want to just try out the game on a variety of devices, then we typically open up Southeast Asia somewhere. David, I want to hear from, from an Asian perspective. I mean, what, what would be a soft launch country? If, if I know that my game is a Korean game, do I only need to test in Korea? That's, that's my, my market. Or do you also play around with other geographies before going all in in a specific market? Well, for, the, for us, geographically, Hong Kong is easy. Right. I mean, that's, our, uh, that's our backyard. But English friendly uh, Singapore. Right. Uh, Malaysia, those are very friendly com countries to launch in just because you don't have to do all the translation on top of, of and, and, and the culturalization stuff that you have to typically do once you really get into a game design. Um, <clears throat> but it is, it is very, very important to approach every market differently. Right. Uh, it's a, and just between uh, Japan, Korea, and China, they all seem like East Asian countries, but I can guarantee you that you will not be able to find the, the, the expert in all three countries. There just is none. I'm a Korean, having worked at SoftBank, living in Hong Kong, 
and I can't do it. Mm -hmm. um, and you need specialists in each market and you need local partners in each country who really know the market. And the game design, even something, I'm, I don't know if you're familiar with the story of the three kingdoms in China. It's a very big <laughs> thing in Asia, right? And everybody in Japan and Korea knows it as well, but that great game in China that worked or in Hong Kong that worked, if you get it in Korea, it doesn't work. Don't know why. And until sometimes, you know, sometimes when you really dig into it, you can, but you have to approach every market very differently, uh, as, at least as far as uh, Asia is concerned. I'll assume the same is for Europe. Things aren't going to be the same in Germany as it is in Spain, for example. Yeah, not, not so sure, really, yeah, to be honest, so sure. because no? I'd say in the world of gaming, there's four islands. There's Japan, Korea, China, and everything else. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, obviously, you need to localize the game, change the language, and so on. But you but have Russia as well, right? Yeah. Russia sometimes behaves. Uh, what I've seen, obviously, I'm I'm out, an, an outsider, but it behaves very similar to Germany. There's mm -hmm. something. Yes, there true. there is something yeah, between Germany and, and and Russia and Italy as well. I mean, oh, I, would I didn't know Italy about Italy as a, as a third one. <laughs> yeah. There, okay. over there, yeah. And Oscar, I mean, with a focus in South of Europe, Latin America, where do you, where, where do you test your games? Do well, you go in Spain? Of, of course, it depends on the game. For example, if, if you launch Buraco, that it's a Brazilian traditional game, right. you have to make you the software in Brazil. Right. I mean, it has no sense to test in New Zealand. Uh, if you make more uh, international game, uh, then we, f we try different countries, but we try to continue with our focus, so we try Spain, France, Italy, and, and some countries in Latin. But again, you have to localize the product. It's not the same if you make a bingo, it's not the same for a Brazilian than for a Spanish guy. Uh, you have to localize all your marketing. I mean, uh, Valentine's Day, it's not the same day in Spain that in Brazil. And, I mean, it's a big failure if you show Valentine's Day in Brazil. Right. And, and all your creativity, I mean, everything is different. I mean, every country is like another game. Cool. So, so we have a game that has been tested. We are pretty sure that it's going to be at least a good game. Um, we're, uh, I like looking at it as the value, and then you need to work on the amplifiers, right? First, you work on, on what actually makes your game attractive to the user. Because if, if the value is zero, then there's no way on amplifying, right, and, and, and distributing. Because uh, even if you amplify zero, it's, it remains zero, right? So, so we have the value here. It's clear. It's engaging. Uh, you were talking about retention. Um, amplifi there are many amplifiers, right? Uh, user acquisition, paid user acquisition, I mean, is one of them. We're, we're going to talk about, about, about it a little bit later. But um, there's also the viral. Uh, tools. Uh, people um, are saying that there's no room almost for games that don't have social integration these days. I wanted to ask you, what's the coolest social integration you've seen? And it cannot be from your own company. <laughs> Something outside. Uh, the coolest social feature that you've seen outside your company. <laughs> it's, it's not a traditional social feature in the way of, of just a Facebook integration, but I think the, the clans in Clash of Clans, because to me that's the number one long-term retention and monetization driver. Yep. Any other examples? I think, um, I think the, the phenomena that happened with uh, what I refer to as the meta platforms, like Kakao in Korea, Line in Japan, WeChat in China, these guys kind of uh, integrated themselves and kind of t became a platform in themselves in that they have such a wide and ubiquitous uh, uh, messaging system, messenger system that, they, that everybody uses in, the, in those languages. And it's all socially connected. These are all your friends in your contact list. And the uh, phenomena of having very competitive environment, friendly competitive, but my my office work, my office mate in the next town over just beat me to, in the leaderboards and that kind of com competitive, and I will spend that extra $2 just to get over him by lunchtime. You know, that, when you multiply that by the tens of millions of users uh, uh, times the sessions per day, you know, that's, now we're talking about big numbers. And uh, I think that's the most uh, eye-opening thing that has happened, at least in 2013-ish, 
yep. uh, is the growth of these meta yeah. platforms. Yeah, I'm not sure if everyone here is, has played around with Kakao, Talk, with Line, with WeChat. Um, can, you, can you share a little bit? Uh, is, are there any differences between the Facebook integrations that we've seen in many games here in Spain compared to what Kakao has to offer, for example? Um, so, uh, always dangerous to overgeneralize uh, an entire country, but uh, Korea is probably the best example because it's a very concentrated environment where if something takes off, um, let's take Gangnam Style, for example, something takes off, it just takes off. Yeah. Uh, Gangnam Style took over kind of globally, but in Korea, that happens on a monthly basis. Something new comes up and everybody's on it. And so a new game, a new app comes in, so everybody's, everybody will test it out and the revenue spikes and some of them stick around plateaus for a while. Eventually they all fade because very short attention span because there's just so much incoming of new stuff. But uh, I think the concentration and the intensity in which people use it is different than how people, you know, Facebook integration is still very, it's very casual. You get to it when you get to it. You know, if you're bored at work, if you're in between chores at home, that's when you use it. In Korea, people are on it, you know, during commute, during their, their cigarette break, their lunch break, this, you know, everybody's competitive on it. Right. And similar thing is happening in, with uh, Line in Japan and China's definitely catching up in that kind of mode. But I don't know if that's necessarily unique to Asia, but it is something that at least anecdotally is what's happening. I, don't, I can't give you the culturalization background as to why that is. Right. From a distribution perspective, do you think this is going to, is, is it going to be sustainable? Are these meta platforms going to keep, keep on being a, a huge distribution platform for, for, or channel for game developers? What's your take on that? Uh, I think the longest we've seen was uh, Kakao Talk in Korea. Now, that platform as a game platform has been around for a year and a half. Yep. Maybe I think, close to two years. Yeah. And, uh, and I would say that right now, it's, you know, if you look at the charts, it's still 19 out of 20 uh, top games are on Kakao. Yep. And again, that is because the competitive nature of it makes, it, makes itself viral. Yep. And so it's kind, of a, it's kind of a virtuous cycle that just kind of spins, spins itself. And I haven't seen it really slow down. I hear just through the rumor mill that their margins aren't as big as they used to be. And what does happen with a successful platform like that is, is the games will do anything to be on that platform. Right. And so the game developers' margins definitely will decrease because they have to forfeit a lot to Kakao yep. uh, uh, for, the, for that success. But as an ecosystem, that's still very vibrant. The only ones that break in the top 20 are the, I don't want to say accidental, but the flappy birds that you can't really explain exactly why. Just, yep. just is. Yep. Yeah, and you have a, a recent experience with Kakao. How, how was it? Is there anything you can share yes, so with Jelly Splash? We launched Jelly Splash, one of our newest titles on, on Kakao, and we had a huge influx of uh, new users in the beginning, so that was, that was very successful on that side. Um, in the end, we weren't able to keep it in the top charts. Okay. So it was really spike up and then a pretty quick downfall again. And so probably our game didn't make... So we did adapt it to Kakao, but probably our game wasn't adapted enough to the kind of Korean mechanics, to the, to the way these viral channels work. Okay. Cool. And then let's talk about user acquisition. How do you select your partners? Um, what, once you decide that the game deserves some marketing spend, how do you, you, you were talking about Facebook. Why did you decide to go with Facebook? Well, at the end, you, you need more than one partner. I mean, you need to be integrated or having at least the SDKs for, for a lot of them. How many, how many on average do you integrate for user acquisition? At least, I think that eight or something like that. Eight. Is that common? A bit more. Yeah, more? At yeah. Least. Yeah. We yeah. try and do zero. Yep. Yeah. We'll, we'll use about that. Yeah. Our favorite is chart boost, though. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> uh, actually, Animoca was a very early adopter of chart boost since, since summer 2011, if I correctly remember. Maria was on the ground uh, at Casual Connect Seattle. And, and uh, yeah, <laughs> long, long time. Cool. Um, and, and, and to get to these eight, 
I mean, or, or zero, but I, 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 you don't integrate their SDKs, but you try to use them. Um, how, I mean, what, how's the decision-making process? Do you have your favorites already that you've tested before? Um, are they different from soft launch to full uh, launch? Yes, so we differentiate between the kind of ROI phase, as you had it on the slide, that yep. was correct, and the launch phase. And during the launch, we'll work with 25, 30, 35 ad networks just to get enough inventory. And, um, and then when we're in the ROI phase, then we'll choose a few large partners and focus on kind of optimizing the performance of those versus then having a kind of spray and pray approach. Cool. Is that anything to add? We have, we have actually a little bit less than two minutes, and um, this is actually a show about technology, entrepreneurship, and innovation, and sometimes it's about failure, <laughs> and, and how, to, how you fail, how you learn about your failure, and then how you wake up or stand, stand up again. What's been the biggest failure <laughs> that your companies have made <laughs> when it comes to launching a game? Let, let's stick to player acquisition and launching a game. Sorry for being yeah, too yeah, hard yeah. here. <laughs> <laughs> no, the Let's start with the biggest success, if you want. <laughs> What's been, what, what is the game that you're most proud of? No, no I can say the failure. OK, cool. Comes um, out. <laughs> I mean, we have launched plenty of games that we believed internally, but the KPIs were not strong enough. And we said, no, but it's, I mean, maybe in other countries that we haven't tested, it's going to work, it's going to work. If the, if the soft launch is, is telling you that uh, it's not going to work, it's not going to work, and sometimes you overwork on the game, and uh, you keep on working on the game, and, uh, and uh, you really believe in that, and uh, so, so then you go and you try to do a user acquisition, so you force stuff, and uh, you get good traffic, and you say no, but maybe the traffic, or maybe sometimes this happens as well from production that they uh, they said that actually acqu the acquisition networks that you try were actually bad. So it's always so our, fault, right? it's our fault, right? It's our fault. It's not your fault. Yeah, that <laughs> happens. That, yeah, that happens sometimes with charbos, man. And uh, no, but that, and uh, sometimes people want to put things on acquisition that is not. I mean, you need a product to be able to to market that product, and that sometimes there are people that think things otherwise. And, uh, and from acquisition, we always say. Give me that product, and that uh, my part is very easy. So right. So so yeah. That's a. That's Any a other mistake. learnings from failure? I think something similar to to him. I mean, the, you want to go to the market, the first one. So when you see your metrics and say, well, it's not what I expect, but if I put more traffic, it's gonna work better. No, it's gonna work worse. <laughs> right. So mm -hmm. I mean, at, when you are in the soft launch, you can target a lot more. You can choose just one, two platform. I mean, and then you say, okay, if I put here a lot of install, at least it's gonna be like this. And no, I mean, I think that's one of big failure. You spend like a lot of money, right. and you say, okay, go back to the soft launch. Right, <laughs> right. It, it's hard. I mean, we normally get very attached to the product, right? It's very hard to just let it go. Um, Jan. Yeah, so I totally feel, Gonzalo, I think every game company has these projects which have gone on too long and you really should be stopping it. Um, to me, I think the difficult balance is always between doing experiments, and that's good if you say this is an experiment and this is the budget, versus losing focus. Because typically in technology and entrepreneurship, there's always tons of options. Also for us as game developers, you can do new meta platforms, you can do new geographies, you can do new genres, you can do new technologies. You could, there's all these new things. And once in a while, you have to set, put your bets and do experiments, but then also kind of keep focused on, on what you're able to do well. I think that sounds very hypothetical now, but that's a, a difficult balance to keep. Yeah, and one of the things in the industry as well is that when you see a trend, everybody wants to follow that trend. Like, mm -hmm. for instance, yeah. Flappy Bear right now. And there's, there's the, like, companies that have a completely different DNA, that, and they don't care, you know, they see the dollars there, and they try to go that way. And that's why, that's why we burn all the trends, you know. It's yeah. like millions of Flappy Bears, and nothing works. So the day Dong took out the Flappy Bird game from the App Store, we saw the same day on a Sunday, we saw 30 Flappy something apps being added on Charboost, and the day after, 150 new apps with Flappy something. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, I, I, yeah we're but crazy. it's more interesting when you start looking who's doing those and you see the other games they had, 
and they are completely different. I know, I know. I, it's just the flappy moment. Care, let's, let's, do it uh, anyway. let's just, yeah, yeah. Anyways, we're running out of time here. Thank you so much for, for being in Barcelona. For those who have uh, traveled from far away, thank you, Oscar, for being the local representation of the Barcelona talent. Thank you so much. Best of luck for 2014. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Thank you very much. Gracias. Thank you very much. David.